Hello everybody, it's been a 007 back for the 32nd episode of our Agatha Christie reread here at Vassals of Kingsgrave. Today we're going to discuss The Body in the Library, which was originally published in 1942. It was written at the same time as N or M, which we discussed in the last episode, and it's the first Miss Marple novel in 12 years. The title of this novel is something of a spoof of a very common trope in murder mystery literature, and the opening is very aware of this and pastiches it. It's one of the funniest openings in Agatha Christie, and she certainly thought so herself. But the meat of the novel is about the murder of two women, or girls I should say, who seemingly have nothing in common. The first is a ballroom dancer. She's 18 and clearly a working class girl who dances for a living and she has caught the eye of a very wealthy older gentleman. And the second girl who is found murdered is a 16 year old local school girl who is a girl guide. Mrs Marple is called in to investigate because the body of the first girl is found in the library of her good friends Dolly and Colonel Bantry and she wants to save their reputation as the entire village is filled with prurient gossip that maybe this is the colonel's fancy woman that he has murdered. As always, we're going to discuss this spoiler-free up until the end credits music, and then we'll get into spoilers and solutions after that music. So let's begin with the concept of this novel, and I want to quote from Gillian Gill's wonderful book on Agatha Christie. She writes, It's also important to see development as well as continuity in Christie's fiction. Thus, by 1942, when Agatha Christie is writing The Body in the Library, she has dropped her early Watson-style narration in favour of an unobtrusive form of omniscient narration and enjoys playing with a detective story genre and with her own fame. Young Peter Carmody proudly shows Miss Marple and Sir Henry Clithering the signatures of famous crime writers he has collected, including that of Agatha Christie. The title and opening sequence of the novel are a spoof of the English country house murder story. Already in 1935's The ABC Murders, Captain Hastings composing his ideal murder had declared to Poirot, scene of the crime? Well, what's wrong with a good old library? Nothing like it for atmosphere. And the body in the library is obviously Christie's attempt to take a hoary old detective chestnut and give it a complicated new twist. The point is made quite explicitly in the first chapter, when Colonel Bantry, roused reluctantly from deep sleep, says to his wife, You've been dreaming, Dolly. It's that detective story you were reading, The Clue of the Broken Match. You know, Lord Edgebaston finds a beautiful blonde dead on the library hearthrug. So I think this perfectly sums up exactly what Agatha Christie is doing at arguably the height of her powers. She's totally in control of the way in which she writes. She's able to confidently spoof detective fiction tropes. And she's even able to have a little giggle and put herself into the book as well and somehow mock her own extensive fame at this moment. So in 1942, at the time of writing, Agatha Christie is 52 she has retrained and is working as a nurse and living in a flat in the Isacon building in Hampstead in London. Her country houses at this point have been requisitioned and her daughter is in the country. Both Agatha Christie's husband and her daughter's husband are serving in the war. So this is a development, right? Rosalind married Major Hubert de Burr Pritchard, son of Colonel Hubert Pritchard in 1940 in Wales. Um, so she and her mother are war wives. But it's very interesting when you think of the context in which this book was written that there's really very little mention of the war at all. Whereas N or M, the previous book that we read in this reread, is full of the war and fifth columnists working in Britain. One wonders whether this was just because Agatha Christie wrote them at the same time when all of her war stuff went into N or M, whether maybe she was trying to provide herself with an escape from what was going on. So between the publication of NRM in November 1941 and the publication of this book in February 1942, this is a little of the historical context. Of course, perhaps most ominously and famously in December 1941, we saw the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor and the United States enter the war on the side of the Allies. Winston Churchill became the first British Prime Minister to address a joint session of Congress. The Battle of Hong Kong begins and ends with Britain losing and Japan occupies Shanghai. So it's a very bad run in Asia Pacific. That said, in more cheery news, Hitler's advance on Moscow was halted for the winter. 
concerning to the horrific events of the Holocaust, the Nazi German Chelmno extermination camp opens in occupied Poland. Between 1941, when it opens, and April 1943, at least 153,000 Jews will be killed in that camp, which is just horrific. As we enter 1942, it's probably worth mentioning that the Uppsala Conflict Data Programme project estimates this to be the deadliest year in human history in terms of conflict deaths, placing the death toll at 4.62 million. So is it any surprise that people took delight in reading escapist murder mysteries? In January 1942, Operation Typhoon, the Battle of Moscow, ends in failure. The Nazis met leadership at the Wannsee Conference in Berlin, deciding that the, quote, final solution to the Jewish problem, end quote, is deportations to extermination camps. Japan took Kuala Lumpur. The last organized allied forces leave British Malaya and the Johor Singapore Causeway is severed. So yet more setbacks in Asia Pacific. And one for pop culture enthusiasts, the American film actress Carol Lombard and her mother are among all 22 killed aboard the TWA Flight 3 when the plane crashed near Las Vegas. She was actually returning from a tour to promote the sale of war bonds. And finally, in February 1942, the month of release of this book, we saw the fall of Singapore, a massive blow to British morale, and Japanese forces began the systematic extermination of perceived hostile elements among Chinese Singaporeans. In America, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, allowing the US military to, to define areas as exclusionary zones. These zones affect the Japanese on the West Coast and Germans and Italians primarily on the East Coast. The Voice of America begins broadcasting and we also saw the start of the internment of Japanese Canadians. So a really grim moment in world history. So let's move into the meat of this book. And as I said, it opens with a body being discovered in the, in the library. But let's start with the investigators, because there are rather a lot of them in this novel. We have Miss Marple, of course, our amateur detective. We've also got Colonel Melchett, the chief constable in the area. Inspector Slack, Dr. Haydock, who's giving the medical opinion. Sir Henry Clithering, who really is Miss Marple's partner in crime. He's the retired head of Scotland Yard, and it's really... The retired police officer, a little underestimated, and Miss Marple, very underestimated, who are doing the serious work here. Also Superintendent Harper. So a vast, vast number of investigators, arguably too many in my view. In St. Mary Mead, we have Dolly Bantry and Colonel Arthur Bantry. And really, they're good friends of Miss Marple. And this is what Dolly says of her husband. He just some, he's just sometimes a little silly about pretty girls who come to tennis. You know, rather fatuous and avuncular. There's no harm in it. And why shouldn't he, after all? I've got the garden. So he's really a charming, slightly sort of country bumpkin squire. And one does feel very sorry for him because, you know, people start cutting him off from invitations. They get ex excluded and cancelled, I suppose you'd say, in modern terminology when this body is found in their library. So it really is a wonderful portrait of how chilling social cancellation can be. Dolly and Colonel Bantry are very much in contrast to a newer, more modern young couple who have come to the village. The man is Basil Blake, who is something in the film industry. He's just moved into a cottage just outside of St. Mary Mead. He loves um, poking fun at the older generation. And basically, he's at the house on weekends when he throws these wild modern parties, which cause a lot of gossip in the village. And he has a partner called Dinah Lee, who is an actress, I think. She has platinum blonde hair and they cause a lot of scandal because they're living in sin. But of course, the victim of this crime is a ballroom dancer at a hotel on the coast near to St. Mary Mead. And the cast of characters there are really, apart from the people in the village, also suspects. They are led by Conway Jefferson, who's a very wealthy, widowed old man. He's disabled. He lost his wife and son and daughter in a plane crash. He's very lonely and sad, but incredibly rich. He's also a friend of the Bantries. And he reminds me a little bit of Simeon Lee in Hercule Poirot's Christmas and Mrs. Boynton, insofar as, while not as evil as those characters, he does exert control through money, as all of these rich old people do. 
This is how Agatha Christie describes him. No sooner were you in the room with him than you felt the power and magnetism of the man. It was as though the injuries which had left him disabled and resulted had resulted in concentrating the vitality of, of his shattered body into a narrower and more intense focus. He had a fine head, the red of the hair slightly grizzled. The face was rugged and powerful, deeply sun-tanned, and the eyes were a startling blue. There was no sign of illness or feebleness about him. So really a very magnetic but powerful man. And this is how he describes his own situation in regards to the dead young girl. So you must understand that essentially I'm a lonely man. I like young people. I enjoy them. Once or twice I've played with the idea of adopting some girl or boy. During this last month I got very friendly with a child who's been killed. She was absolutely natural, completely naive. She chatted on about her life and her experiences in pantomime with touring companies, with mum and dad as a child in cheap lodgings. Such a different life from any I've known. Never complaining, never seeing it as sordid. Just a natural, uncomplaining, hard-working child, unspoilt and charming. Not a lady, perhaps, but thank God, neither vulgar nor abominable word, ladylike. So there you go. He's a lonely old man. He's found a charming young girl who seems rather naive and he wants to adopt her. And obviously she comes from a different social class from him. And this is a very big theme in the novel. This is how his son-in-law, Mark Gaskell, refers to him, though. I'm very fond of him and at the same time I resent him. I'll try and explain. Conway Jefferson is a man who likes to control his surroundings. He's a benevolent despot, kind, generous and affectionate. But his is the tune and the others dance to his piping. So in contrast to Simeon Lee and Mrs. Boynton, he is a despot but a a benevolent one. So that brings us to Mark Gaskell's. He's Rosamond Jefferson's widower, so uh, Conway Jefferson's son-in-law. Uh, Both of the children were settled with very large allowances when they got married. So Mark Gaskell's sort of independently wealthy and Conway Jefferson would assume that he doesn't need any more money from him. This is what Colonel Melchett, the chief constable, thinks of Mark Gaskell when he first meets him. He didn't much care for the fellow, a bold, unscrupulous, hawk-like face. One of those men who usually get their own way and whom women frequently admire. But not the sort of fellow I'd trust, the colonel thought to himself unscrupulous that was the word for him so that's the one in-law that Conway Jefferson has the other is Adelaide Jefferson who is Frank Jefferson's widow this is what Agatha Christie says of her Adelaide Jefferson had the power of creating a restful atmosphere she was a woman who never seemed to say anything remarkable but who succeeded in stimulating other people to talk and setting them at their ease So a much nicer kind of a description. And Adelaide also has the young son, the one who is very much a fan of murder mysteries. And she's not actually, he's not actually um, Frank Jefferson's son. So in a sense, Adelaide is relying on Conway to think of this as his grandson to get an inheritance. So that's the family, Conway and the two in-laws, Mark Gaskell and Adelaide Jefferson. Then we move to the staff at the hotel. So we have Ruby Keane, the 18-year-old dancer. That's her stage name. She was actually born Rosie Legg. Uh, Agatha Christie was originally going to call her Queenie. So very much seen as working class, but nothing wrong with that. This is how the manager at the hotel describes her. She was very young, of course, rather cheap in style, perhaps for a place of this guy kind. She was very young, of course, rather cheap in style, perhaps for a place of this kind, but nice manners, quiet and well-behaved, danced well. People liked her. Wouldn't have been much without makeup. As it was, she managed to look quite attractive. So it's funny, isn't it, how a lot of people are judging her for being sort of cheap and working class, but not Conway Jefferson. The reason she's in the hotel is because her cousin, Josie Turner, who was actually the original professional dancer in the hotel, had twisted her ankle, so asked her cousin to come and take her place. This is what Agatha Christie says of her, through the eyes of the colonel. She was a good-looking woman of perhaps nearer 30 than 20. Her looks depended more on skillful grooming than actual features. She looked competent and good-tempered with plenty of common sense. She was not the type that would ever be described as glamorous, but she had nevertheless plenty of attraction. She was discreetly made up and wore a dark tailor-made suit. So this is a woman who has raised herself up from working class beginnings and looks more amenable to the rich people that she has to entertain. So Josie Turner, and now Ruby Keane's dance partner, is a man called Raymond Starr. He also works as a tennis professional in the hotel and is implied to be a bit of a gigolo. 
There's also a young man staying at the hotel called George Bartlett, who is Ruby's last dance partner and is described as a brainless young ass. Maybe a bit of a hangover from that PG Woodhouse phase that Agatha Christie had. And if we move to the second victim, Pamela Reeves, the local girl guide who was missing age 16, she has some friends. One of them is Florence Small, who will provide evidence. And then we also have hanging around the hotel, Hugo McLean, who's a long time a friend of Adelaide, who wants to marry her. After all, she's been a widow for quite some time. So those are the characters. We're effect- effectively investigating, I would say, Basil Blake in the village, and then all the people who are in the hotel, because the key, key bit of evidence is that Conway Jefferson was not just going to adopt uh, Ruby, but he was going to settle a very large sum of money on her. So you have to work out who stands to lose out from that inheritance being diluted as well. We often discuss on this podcast whether the books hold up to a modern reader, whether they are progressive or regressive. I would say that a lot of the stuff that strikes a reader as painful to read is more about class than race, which is unusual. That said, I'm not sure those class prejudices have really gone away in British society, so I'm not sure whether it dates the book at all. I do, however, think it's one of the first novels with lots of working class characters that actually matter. And that, I think, is interesting and was also maybe true of N or M and shows maybe Agatha Christie more getting involved in the real working class life during the war and considering the life of ordinary English people. There is, however, a little bit of racism in there or or sort of bigotry. Here's Here's a dialogue exchange, which is just horrible. Quote, don't flatter yourself. I hate to see a girl I like who can't hold a drink and lets a disgusting Central European pour about. Don't flatter yourself. I hate to see a girl I like who can't hold a drink and lets a disgusting Central European pour her about. The response, also a quote, that's a damn lie. You were drinking pretty hard yourself and going on with that black haired Spanish bitch, end quote. So, yeah, not a particularly nice conversation between Basil Blake and Dinah Lee. In terms of adaptations of this novel, I think it's absolutely fascinating that it's not the first Miss Marple. But if you look at the two British TV series that covered all of the Marples, they choose to put this one first because it is in some way seen as the quintessential Marple, maybe because it is dealing with that trope of the body in the library. For my money, I rather prefer Murder in the Vicarage in terms of its solution. I think it's neater. I do have issues with the solution of this book which I shall discuss after the end credits music. But in some ways, I think it's a better novel for those of us reading the books as a chronicle of the times and seeing how British society changes. I think there's something so fascinating about the false gentility of this posh hotel on the seaside, which is really staffed with working middle class people who but want to seem grand, you know. And I've stayed in a few of those faded seaside hotels and they do have this kind of appalling fake gentility about them. The first adaptation was made in 1984. It was part of the BBC Miss Marple series starring Joan Hickson. It's very old fashioned. It's very faithful to the novel. And I think it's absolutely delightful, actually. It's a great cast and it does take you very clearly through the plot. Filmed in a very extravagant hotel with a lovely manor house. It's just, it's really delightful. I love Joan Hickson as Miss Marple. To me, she is the quintessential. We then have a second adaptation that was made in 2004 when ITV, the rival TV channel in the UK, decided to resurrect a Marple series. And this one stars Geraldine McEwen, who I also love, but she's very different to Joan Hickson. Joan Hickson is wise and sage and, oh, you wouldn't want to come up against her. Whereas Geraldine McEwen is rather mischievous, and I do like that about her. It's got a fantastic cast. It's got James Fox as Colonel Bantry, Joanna Lumley as Dolly Bantry, Ian Richardson as Colonel as Conway Jefferson, and Simon Callow as the inspector, and even a very young David Williams as Bartlett. So it's a great cast, great setting. And it's basically faithful to the novel. I'll discuss one change in the spoiler section. But the other change is that they move the timing very explicitly to World War II. And rather than having Conway Jefferson's children killed in a plane crash, it has them killed in a V2 strike on their London home. And it makes Mark, Frank and Peter's father all RAF pilots in the war. And actually, this is one of the changes I really like because it situates the novel in the war. I think it comments on the danger that Agatha Christie herself was facing by staying in London and speaks to very much the dangers that 
you know, Londoners in general were facing. So I actually think this is a really nice um, adaptation. They also take a, away some of the investigators, which I think is good. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I think both of these actually are pretty good adaptations and you can watch both of them with great pleasure. At any rate, whatever you're watching this week and whatever you're reading, I hope you enjoy it. If you're following along at home, our next podcast, which I hope will be a group one because it's one of my all-time favourite Agatha Christie's, I think one of her best, is Five Little Pigs, published in January 1943. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this podcast and stay tuned for a spoiler-filled discussion after the music. Okay, so what is the solution to this? The solution is that Mark Gaskell and Josie Turner are secretly married, but they don't want to tell Conway Jefferson because they don't want Mark to be disinherited. Mark has actually blown through the original marriage settlement he had from Conway Jefferson because he has a gambling habit. And actually, Adelaide um, Jefferson has also got none of her marriage settlement left because her dead husband frittered it away on bad investments. So they are incredibly dependent on the old man for money. Neither of them is therefore excited to discover that Ruby Keane has um, fallen into his good graces and is now going to inherit £50,000. So Josie and Mark decide to murder Ruby Keane, but they need to establish a timeline and an alibi. So what they do is they charm a little girl guide and say that they're going to run a Hollywood screen test and that she will be chaperoned. They bring her to the hotel. They dye her hair peroxide blonde. They paint her nails red and they put her in a posh dress. They drug her and then they strangle her and they leave her in the library. Well, they don't leave her in the library and then they leave her in the lounge, actually, of Basil Blake, because they know about his scurrilous reputation as a degenerate film guy, and they decide he'll be the perfect patsy. What they don't count on is that a very drunk Basil Blake, when he discovers the body, decides to play a very nasty prank on Colonel Bantry, wraps her up in the hearth rug, and leaves her in Colonel Bantry's library. So the body has, in fact, been moved. Our nasty couple, Mark and Josie then conspire to kill the real Ruby Keen. They put her in George Bartlett's car, they bash her face in and they set the car alight so that the identification of the two bodies will successfully have been pulled off as the wrong way round. What are the clues that enable to solve this? Well, number one, always suspect an actor. So we should know that Basil Blake and Diana Lee maybe aren't quite as bad as people think they are. Always in Agatha Christie wonder if a couple really are together or aren't together. Secret marriages abound. And in this novel, we have two of them. We have Diana Lee and Basil Blake, but we also have um, Josie and Mark. And it's the first marriage that tips off um, Miss Marple that there might be a second secret marriage too. Always question the identity of an identifiable body. Money is typically the motive, so just ask who's to benefit, and then that narrows you down to Adelaide and Mark. And I think it's particularly wonderful that that ITV adaptation therefore makes it Adelaide rather than Mark. It works perfectly well either way. And remember from reading Evil Under the Sun when Hercule Poirot says that all bodies are alike, just like slabs of meat when you see them laid out on a beach. And think about what is similar in these two girls who outwardly seem so dissimilar. And I think this is where Miss Marple comes into play because she notices things about the girls that others don't. This is what Gillian Gill, once again I'm quoting for her, from her wonderful book, says about the solution. Miss Marple is able to sort out the double murder plot because she alone looks carefully at the body in the library and has a female framework into which she fits the visual evidence of bitten varnished fingernails and tawdry, rather worn finery. When Colonel Melchett and Inspector Slack read blonde hair, flimsy ball gowns and garish nails as London glamour with overtones of sexual promiscuity, Miss Marple reads them as class markers, age indicators and items of fashion with no necessary moral connotations. And it's interesting, isn't it, breaking off from the Gillian Gill quote, that when the autopsy is performed, they note that the body in the library is still a virgin. And I guess the rather tawdry implication is that Ruby Keane wouldn't have been 
back to Gillian Gill. Perfectly conscious of the way her own appearance affects her public image, Miss Marple views costume changes as image creators that a young woman in particular may put on according to her game plan. As a later Christie heroine, Ginger Corrigan, says in The Pale Horse, different clothes and lots of makeup and my best friend wouldn't look at me twice. Just as murderess Josie can mastermind a plot depending on the transformation of Pamela into Ruby, Miss Marple can defeat that plot because she is able to visualise that the brash, sexy young adventurous Ruby is only a hairdo, a makeup job and a change of clothing away from the brown-haired, pigtailed, guide-uniformed schoolgirl Pamela. Given an average face and figure, any young girl in the kitchen, in the schoolroom, in the drugstore, can metamorphose into a Cinderella, a Gigi or a Lana Turner. Or so the myth goes, and Miss Marple is not so old and spinsterish as to have forgotten the real life power of such myths. And I think that's really true. This is a murder that only Miss Marple can solve through close observation and understanding that between an 18-year-old girl forced onto the stage by rather a sad upbringing and 16-year-old Pamela, there isn't really that much difference. And I love that about the solution to this novel. And maybe that's why people do think of it as the quintessential Marple. My only criticism is, is it really plausible that they could peroxide blonde a brunette's hair in that amount of time? And maybe they should have just picked someone who was a blonde anyway. But at any rate, I do think this is a very well-constructed plot. I love the mischief of Basil Blake moving the body just to sort of poke fun at, at Colonel Bantry. And I love the fact that we have not one, but two secret marriages. It is fascinating though, isn't it? Reading this in the context of Evil Under the Sun to see the similarities and see the same kind of brainwave and thought process around underlying, stripping away all externalities. What do people truly look like? What do bodies look like? I hope you've enjoyed this little discussion and will come back to us for Five Little Pigs. If you have any comments, please join us on the Vassals of King's Grave Discord. Just search for VOK Podcast and you'll find us. Thank you for listening. Thank you.